This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Taming of the Shrew by William Shakespeare. Dramatis Personae. Persons in the Induction. A Lord. Read by Bob Sherman. Christopher Sly, a Tinker. Read by David Lawrence. Hostess. Read by Niru Ayur. Page. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Players. Read by Elizabeth Clett. Huntsman. Read by Glenn Simonson. Read by Catalina Watt. Servants. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. Read by Abigail Bartels. Read by Michael Wolfe. Read by Vaughn Ullman. Baptista Minola, a rich gentleman of Padua. Ernst Patinama. Vincenzo, an old gentleman of Pisa. Played by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Lucentio, son to Vincenzo, in love with Bianca. Read by M.B. Petruccio, a gentleman of Verona, suitor to Caterina. Read by Bologna Times. Suitors to Bianca, Gremio. Read by the Rat King. Hortensio. Read by Miriam Esther Goldman. Servants to Lucentio. Tranio. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Biondello. Read by Matthew Ward. Servants to Petruccio. Grumio. Read by Dennis Sayers. Curtis. Read by Greg Vestal. Pedant. Set up to personate Vincenzio. Read by Tom Hackett. Daughters to Baptista. Catarina the Shrew. Read by Kristen Hughes. Bianca. Read by Musical Heart One. Widow. Read by Niru Ayur. Taylor. Read by Michael Wolf. Haberdasher. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. And servants attending on Baptista and Petruccio. Read by Lucy Perry. Read by Redea. Read by Glenn Simonson. Narrated by Abai. Scene. Sometimes in Padua and sometimes in Petruccio's house in the country. Induction. Scene 1. Before an alehouse on a heath. Enter hostess and sly. I'll feed you in faith. A pair of stocks, you rogue. You're a baggage. The slies are no rogues. Look in the chronicles. We came in with Richard Conqueror. Therefore, Pacus Palabras, let the world slide, Sessa. You will not pay for the glasses you have burst? No, not a denier. Go by, St. Geronimy. Go to thy cold bed and warm thee. I know my remedy. I must go fetch the third borrow. Exit. Third or fourth or fifth borrow. I'll answer him by law. I'll not budge an inch, boy. Let him come and kindly lies down on the ground and falls asleep horns winded enter a lord from hunting with huntsmen and servants huntsman i charge thee tender well my hounds bratch merriman the poor cur is embossed and coupled clowder with the deep-mouthed bratch sawst thou not boy how silver made it good at the hedge corner in the coldest fault i would not lose the dog for twenty pound why bellman is as good as he my lord he cried upon it at the merest loss, and twice today picked out the dullest scent. Trust me, I take him for the better dog. Thou art a fool. If Echo were as fleet, I would esteem him worth a dozen such. But sup them well, and look unto them all. Tomorrow I intend to hunt again. I will, my lord. See, Sly. What's here? One dead or drunk? See, doth he breathe? He breathed, my lord. Were he not warmed with ale, this were a bed but cold to sleep so soundly. Oh, monstrous beast, how like a swine he lies! Grim death, how foul and loathsome is thine image! Sirs, I will practice on this drunken man. What think you, if, if he were conveyed to bed, wrapped in sweet clothes, Rings put upon his fingers, a most delicious banquet by his bed, and brave attendance near him when he wakes. Would not the beggar then forget himself? Believe me, lord, I think he cannot choose. 
It would seem strange unto him when he waked. Even as a flattering dream or worthless fancy. Then take him up and manage well the jest. Carry him gently to my fairest chamber and hang it round with all my wanton pictures. Balm his foul head in warm distilled waters and burn sweet wood to make the lodging sweet. <laughs> Procure me music ready when he wakes to make a dulcet and a heavenly sound. And if he chance to speak, be ready straight, and with a low submissive reverence say, What is it your honour will command? Let one attend him with a silver basin full of rose-water and bestrewed with flowers. Another bear the ewer, the third a diaper, and say, Will it please your lordship, cool your hands? Some one be ready with a costly suit, and ask him what apparel he will wear. Another tell him of his hounds and horse, and that his lady mourns at his disease. Persuade him that he hath been lunatic, and when he says he is, Say that he dreams, for he is nothing but a mighty lord. This do, and do it kindly, gentle sirs. It will be pastime passing excellent, if it be husbanded with modesty. My lord, I warrant you we will play our part. As he shall think by our true diligence, he is no less than what we say he is. Take him up gently, and to bed with him, and each one to his office when he wakes. Sly is borne out. A trumpet sounds. Sirrah, go see what trumpet tis that sounds. Exit servant. Be like some noble gentleman that means travelling some journey to repose him here. Re-enter servant. How oh, now, who is it? And it please, your honour, players that offer service to your lordship. Bid them come near. Enter players. Now, fellows, you are welcome. We thank your honour. Do you intend to stay with me tonight? So please your lordship to accept our duty. With all my heart. This fellow I remember, since once he played a, a farmer's eldest son. T'was where you wooed the gentlewoman so well. I have forgot your name, but sure that part was aptly fitted and naturally performed. I think t'was Soto that your honour means. Tis very true, thou didst it excellent. Well, you are come to me in happy time, the rather for I have some sport in hand wherein your cunning can assist me much. There is a lord will hear you play to-night, but I am doubtful of your modesties, lest, over-eyeing of his odd behaviour, for yet his honour never heard a play, you break into some merry passion and so offend him, for I tell you, sirs, if you should smile he grows impatient." Fear not, my lord, we can contain ourselves, were he the veriest antic in the world. Go, sirrah, take them to the buttery, and give them friendly welcome, every one. Let them want nothing that my house affords. Exit one with the players. Sirrah, go you to Bartholomew, my page, and see him dressed in all suits like a lady. That done, conduct him to the drunkard's chamber, and call him madam. Do him obeisance. Tell him from me, as he will win my love, he bear himself with honourable action, such as he hath observed in noble ladies unto their lords, by them accomplished. Such duty to the drunkard let him do, with soft low tongue and lowly courtesy, and say, What is it your honour will command, wherein your lady and your humble wife may show her duty and make known her love? And then, with kind embracements, tempting kisses, and with declining head into his bosom, bid him shed tears, as being overjoyed to see her noble lord restored to health, who for this seven years hath esteemed him no better than a poor and loathsome beggar. And if the boy have not a woman's gift to rain a shower of commanded tears, an onion will do well for such a shift, which in a napkin being close conveyed shall in despite enforce a watery eye. See this dispatched with all the haste thou canst. Anon I'll give thee more instructions. Exit servant. I know the boy will well usurp the grace, voice, gait, and action of a gentlewoman. Oh, I long to hear him call the drunkard husband. 
and how my men will stay themselves from laughter when they do homage to this simple peasant. I'll in to counsel them. Haply my presence may well abate the over-merry spleen, which otherwise would grow into extremes. Exeunt. Scene 2. A bedchamber in the Lord's house. Sly is discovered in a rich nightgown with attendants, some with apparel, basin, ewer, and other appurtenances, and Lord dressed like a servant. For God's sakes, a pot of small ale. Will please your lordship drink a cup of sack? Will it please your honour taste of these conserves? What raiment will your honour wear today? I am Christophero Sly. Call me not honour nor lordship. I ne'er drank sack in my life, and if you give me any conserves, give me conserves of beef. Ne'er ask me what raiment I'll wear, for I have no more doublets and backs, no more stockings and legs, nor more shoes and feet, nay, sometimes more feet than shoes, or such shoes as my toes look through the overleather. Heaven cease this idle humour in your honour. Oh, that a mighty man of such descent of such possessions, and so high esteem should be infused with so foul a spirit. What? Would you make me mad? Am I not Christopher Sly, old Sly's son of Burton Heath, by birth a peddler, by education a card-maker, by transmutation a bear-herd, and now by present profession a tinker? Ask Marion Hackett, the fat ale wife of Wincott, if she know me not. If she say I am not fourteen pence on the score for sheer ale, score me up for the lyingest knave in Christendom. What, am I not bestraught? Here's— Oh, this it is that makes your lady mourn. Oh, this is it that makes your servants droop. Hence comes it that your kindred shuns your house, as beaten hence by your strange lunacy. O oh, noble lord, bethink thee of thy birth. Call home thy ancient thoughts from banishment, and banish hence these abject lowly dreams. Look how thy servants do attend on thee, each in his office ready at thy beck. Wilt thou have music? Hark, Apollo plays, and twenty caged nightingales do sing. Music. Or wilt thou sleep? We'll have thee to a couch softer and sweeter than the lustful bed on purpose trimmed up for Semiramis. Say thou wilt walk, we will bestrew the ground. Or wilt thou ride, thy horses shall be trapped, their harness studded all with gold and pearl. Dost thou love hawking? Thou hast hawks will soar above the morning lark. Or wilt thou hunt? Thy hounds shall make the welkin answer them, and fetch shall echoes from the hollow earth. Say thou wilt course, thy greyhounds are as swift as breathed stags, I fleeter than the roe. Dost thou love pictures? We will fetch thee straight to Donus, painted by a running brook, and Cytheria all in sedges hid, which seem to move and wanton with her breath, even as the waving sedges play with wind. We'll show thee Io as she was a maid, and how she was beguiled and surprised, as lively painted as the deed was done. Or Daphne roaming through a thorny wood, scratching her legs, that one shall swear she bleeds, and at that sight shall sad Apollo weep, so workmanly the blood and tears are drawn. Thou art a lord, and nothing but a lord. Thou hast a lady far more beautiful than any woman in this waning age. And till the tears that she hath shed for thee, like envious floods, o'errun her lovely face, she was the fairest creature in the world, and yet she is inferior to none. Am I a lord? And have I such a lady? Or do I dream? Or have I dreamed till now? I do not sleep. I see. I hear. I speak. I smell sweet savours, and I feel soft things. Upon my life I am a lord indeed, and not a tinker, nor Christophero sly. Well, bring our lady hither to our sight, and once again a pot of the smallest ale. Will't please your mightiness to wash your hands? Servants present a ewer, basin, and napkin. 
oh, how we joy to see your wit restored. Oh, that once more you knew but what you are. These fifteen years you've been in a dream, or when you waked, so waked as if you slept. These fifteen years! By my fay, a goodly nap! But did I never speak of all that time? Oh, yes, my lord, but very idle words. For though you lay here in this goodly chamber, yet would you say ye were beaten out of door, and rail upon the hostess of the house, and say you would present her at the leet, because she brought stone jugs and no sealed courts. Sometimes you would call out for Cicely Hackett. Ay, the woman's maid of the house. Why, sir, you know no house, nor no such maid, nor no such men as you have reckoned up as Stephen Sly, and old John Knapps of Greece, and Peter Turf, and Henry Pimpernel, and twenty more such names and men as these, which never were, nor no man ever saw. Now, Lord, be thanked for my good amends. Amen. I thank thee, thou shalt not lose by it. Enter the page as a lady with attendants. How fares my noble lord? Mary, I fare well, for here is cheer enough. Where is my wife? Here, noble lord, what is thy will with her? Are you my wife, and will not call me a husband? My men should call me lord. I am your goodman. My husband and my lord, my lord and husband, I am your wife in all obedience. I know it well. What must I call her? Madam. Else, madam? Or Joan, madam? Madam, and nothing else. So lords call ladies. Madam wife, they say that I have dreamed and slept above some fifteen year or more. Ay, and the time seems thirty unto me, being all this time abandoned from your bed. Tis much. Servants, leave me and her alone. Madame, undress you, and come now to bed. Thrice, noble lord, let me entreat of you, to pardon me yet for a night or two, or if not so, until the sun be set. For your physicians have expressly charged, in peril to incur your former malady, that I should yet absent me from your bed. I hope this reason stands for my excuse. Ay, it stands so that I may hardly tarry so long, but I would be loath to fall into my dreams again. I will therefore tarry, in despite of the flesh and the blood. Enter a servant. Your honour's players, hearing your amendment, are come to play a pleasant comedy, for so your doctors hold it very meet, seeing too much sadness hath congealed your blood, and melancholy is the nurse of frenzy. Therefore they thought it good you hear a play, and frame your mind to mirth and merriment, which bars a thousand harms and lengthens life. Mary, I will. Let them play it. Is not a comedy a Christmas gambled, or a tumbling trick? No, my good lord, it is more pleasing stuff. What, household stuff? It is a kind of history. Well, we'll see it. Come, madame wife, sit by my side and let the world slip. We shall ne'er be younger. Flourish. End of induction. Act One. Scene One. Padua. A public place. Enter Lucentio and Tranio. Ah, Tranio, since for the great desire I had to see fair Padua, nursery of arts, I am arrived for fruitful Lombardy, the pleasant garden of great Italy, and by my father's love and leave him armed with his good will, and thy good company. My trusty servant, well approved in all, here let us breathe and haply institute a course of learning and ingenious studies. Pisa, renowned for grave citizens, gave me my being and my father first, a merchant of great traffic through the world, Vincentio, come of the Ventivoli. Vincentio's son, brought up in Florence, it shall become to serve all hopes conceived, to deck his fortune with his virtuous deeds. And therefore, Tranio, for the time I study. Virtue and that part of philosophy will I apply that treats of happiness by virtue specially to be achieved. But tell me thy mind, for I have Pisa left, and am to Padua come as he that leaves a shallow plash, to plunge him in the deep, and with satiety seeks to quench his thirst. Me perdonato, gentle master mine, I am in all affected as yourself, glad that you thus continue your resolve to suck the sweets of sweet philosophy. Only, good master, while we do admire this virtue and this moral discipline, 
Let's be no Stoics, nor no Stocks, I pray, or so devote to Aristotle's checks, as Ovid be an outcast quite abjured. Balk logic with acquaintance that you have, and practice rhetoric in your common talk. Music and poesy used to quicken you. The mathematics and the metaphysics fall to them as you find your stomach serves you. No profit grows where is no pleasure tain. In brief, sir, study what you most affect. Ah, <laughs> gramercy, Stranio, well dost thou advise. If, Biondello, thou wert come ashore, we could at once put in readiness, and take a lodging fit to entertain such friends as time in Padua shall beget. But stay a while, what company is this? Master, some show to welcome us to town. Enter Baptista, Caterina, Bianca, Gremio, and Hortensio. Lucentio and Tranio stand aside. Gentlemen, importune me no further, for how I firmly am resolved you know. That is, not to bestow my youngest daughter before I have a husband for the elder. If either of you both love Caterina, because I know you well and love you well, leave shall you have to court her at your pleasure. To cart her, rather. She's too rough for me. There, there, Hortensio. Will you any wife? Caterina to Baptista. I pray you, sir, is it your will to make a stale of me amongst these mates? Mates, maid? How mean you that? No mates for you, unless you were of gentler, milder mould. If faith, sir, you shall never need to fear. I was it not half-way to her heart. But if it were, doubt not her care should be to comb your noddle with a three-legged stool, and paint your face, and use you like a fool. From all such devils, good Lord, deliver us. And me too, good Lord. Hushed, master, here's some good pastime toward. That wench is stark mad, or wonderful froward. But in the other's silence do I see maid's mild behaviour and sobriety of peace, Tranio. Well said, master, mum, and gaze your fill. Gentlemen, that I may soon make good what I have said. Bianca, get you in. And let it not displease thee, good Bianca, for I will love thee ne'ertheless, my girl. A pretty Pete! It is best put a finger in the eye, and she knew why. Sister, content you in my discontent. Sir, to your pleasure, humbly I subscribe. My books and instruments shall be my company, on them to look and practice by myself. Hark, Tranio! Thou mayst hear Minerva speak. Signor Baptista, will you be so strange? Sorry am I that our good will affects Bianca's grief. Why will you mew her up, Signor Baptista, for this fiend of hell, and make her bear the penance for her tongue? Gentlemen, content ye, I am resolved. Go in, Bianca. Exit Bianca. And for I know she taketh most delight in music, instruments, and poetry, schoolmasters will I keep within my house fit to instruct her youth. If you, Hortensio, or Signor Grimio, you, know any such, prefer them hither, for to cunning men I will be very kind, and liberal to mine own children in good bringing up. And so, farewell. Caterina, you may stay, for I have more to commune with Bianca. Exit. Why, and I trust I may go too, may I not? What, shall I be appointed ours, as though belike I knew not what to take and what to leave? Ha! Exit. You may go to the devil's dam. Your gifts are so good, here's none will hold you. Their love is not so great, Hortensio, but we may blow our nails together and fast it fairly out, our cakes dough on both sides. Farewell, yet for the love I bear my sweet Bianca, if I can by any means light on a fit man to teach her that wherein she delights, I will wish him to her father. So will I, Signor Grimio. But a word, I pray. Though the nature of our quarrel yet never brute parley, Know now, upon advice, it toucheth us both, that we may yet again have access to our fair mistress, and be happy rivals in Bianca's love, to labor and effect one thing specially. What's that, I pray? Marry, sir, to get a husband for her sister. A husband? A devil. I say a husband. I say a devil. Thinkest thou, Hortensio, though her father be very rich, any man is so very a fool to be married to hell? Tush, Grimio, though it pass your patience and mine to endure her loud alarms, why, man, there be good fellows in the world, 
and a man could light on them would take her with all faults and money enough. I cannot tell, but I had as lief take her dowry with this condition, to be whipped at the high cross every morning. Faith, as you say, there's small choice in rotten apples. But come, since this bar-in-law makes us friends, it shall be so far forth friendly maintained, till by helping Baptista's eldest daughter to a husband, we set his youngest free for a husband, and then have to it afresh, sweet Bianca. Happy man be his dole. He that runs fastest gets the ring. How say you, Signor Grimio? I am agreed, and would I had given him the best horse in Padua to begin his wooing, that would thoroughly woo her, wed her, and bed her, and rid the house of her. Come on. Exeunt Grimio and Hortensio. I pray, sir, tell me, is it possible that love should of a sudden take such a hold? Oh, Tranio, till I found it to be true, I never thought it possible or likely. But see, while idly I stood looking on, I found the effect of love in idleness. And now in plainness do confess to thee that art to me as secret and as dear as Anna to the Queen of Carthage was. Tranio, I burn, I pine, I perish, Tranio, if I achieve not this young, modest girl. Counsel me, Tranio, for I know thou canst. Assist me, Tranio, for I know thou wilt. Master, it is no time to chide you now. Affection is not rated from the heart. If love have touched you, naught remains but so. Redime te captum quam quias minimo. Ah, grim mercies, lad, go forward. This contents. The rest will comfort, for thy counsel's sound. Master, you looked so longly on the maid. Perhaps you marked not what's the pith of all. Oh, yes, I saw a sweet beauty in her face such as the daughter of Agenor had, that made great Jove to humble him to her hand, when with his knees he kissed the Cretan strand. Saw you no more? Marked you not how her sister began to scold and raise up such a storm that mortal ears might hardly endure the din? Tranio, I saw her coral lips to move, and with her breath she did perfume the air. Sacred and sweet was all I saw in her. <sighs> Nay, then, tis time to stir him from his trance. I pray, awake, sir. If you love the maid, bend thoughts and wits to achieve her. Thus it stands. Her elder sister is so cursed and shrewd, that till the father rid his hands of her, master, your love must live a maid at home, and therefore has he closely mewed her up, because she will not be annoyed with suitors. Ah, Tranio, what a cruel father's he! But art thou not advised he took some care to get her cunning schoolmasters to instruct her? I marry am I, sir, and now tis plotted. I have it, Tranio. Master, for my hand both our inventions meet and jump in one. Tell me thine first. You will be schoolmaster, and undertake the teaching of the maid. That's your device. It is. May it be done? Not possible. For who shall bear your part and be in Padua here Vincenzio's son, keep house and ply his book, welcome his friends, visit his countrymen and bank with them? Basta! Content thee, for I have it in full. We have not yet been seen in any house, nor can we be distinguished by our faces, for man or master. Then it follows thus. Thou shalt be master, Tranio, in my stead. Keep house and port and servants as I should. I will some other be, some Florentine, some Neapolitan or meaner man of Pisa. Tis hatched, and shall be so. Tranio, at once uncase thee. Take my coloured hat and cloak. When Biondello comes, he waits on thee. But I will charm him first to keep his tongue. They exchange habits so had you need in brief sir sith it your pleasure is and i am tied to be obedient for so your father charged me at our parting be serviceable to my son quoth he although i think twas in another sense i am content to be lucentio because so well i love lucentio tranio be so because lucentio loves and let me be a slave to achieve that maid whose sudden sight hath thralled my wounded eye. Ah, here comes the rogue. Enter Biondello. Sirrah, where have you been? Where have I been? Nay, how now? Where are you? 
Master, has my fellow Tranio stolen your clothes? Or you stolen his, or both? Pray, what's the news? Sirrah, come hither, tis no time to jest, and therefore frame your manners to the time. Your fellow Tranio here, to save my life, puts my apparel and my countenance on, and I for my escape have put on his. For in a quarrel, since I came ashore, I killed the man, and fear I was descried. Wait you on him, I charge you, as becomes, while I make way from hence to save my life. You understand me? Ay, sir. Ne'er a wit. And not a jot of Tranio in your mouth. Tranio is changed to Lucentio. The better for him. Would I were so too. So could I, faith, boy, to have the next wish after, that Lucentio indeed had Baptista's youngest daughter. But, Sirrah, not for my sake, but your master's, I advise you use your manners discreetly in all kinds of companies. When I am alone, why, then I am Tranio. But in all places else, your master Lucentio. Tranio, let's go. Uh, one more thing rests, that thyself execute, to make one among these wooers. If thou ask me why, sufficeth my reasons are both good and weighty. Excellent. The presenters above speak. My lord, you nod. You do not mind the play. Yes, by St. Anne, I do. A good matter, surely. Comes there any more of it? My lord, tis but begun. Tis a very excellent piece of work. Madame Lady, would twere done. They sit and mark. Scene two. Padua. Before Hortensio's house. Enter Petruchio and his men Grumio. Verona, for a while take my leave, to see my friends in Padua. But of all my best beloved and approved friend, Hortensio, and I trow this is his house. Here, Sirrah Grumio. Knock, I say. Knock? Sir, whom should I knock? Is there any man has rebused your worship? Villain, I say, knock me here soundly. Knock you here, sir? Why, sir, what am I, sir, that I should knock you here, sir? Villain, I say, knock me at this gate, and wrap me well, or I'll knock your knave's pate. My master is grown quarrelsome. I should knock you first, and then I know after who comes by the worst. Will it not be? Faith, sirrah, and you'll not knock. I'll ring it. I'll try how you can sol fa and sing it. He rings Grumio by the ears. Oh, help, masters, help! My master is mad. Now knock when I bid you, sirrah villain. Enter Hortensio. How now? What's the matter? My old friend Grumio, and my good friend Petruchio. How do you all at Verona? Signor Hortensio, come you to part the fray? Con tutto il cuore ben trovato, may I say. Alla nostra casa benvenuto. Molto honorato, signor mio Petruchio. Rise, Grumio, rise. We will compound this quarrel. Nay, tis no matter, sir, what he ledges in Latin. If this be not a lawful cause for me to leave his service, look you, sir, he bid me knock him, and rap him soundly, sir. Well, was it fit for a servant to use his master so, being, perhaps, for aught I see, two and thirty, a pip out? Who would to God I had well knocked at first? Then had not Grumio come by the worst. A senseless villain. Good Hortensio, I bade the rascal knock upon your gate, and could not get him for my heart to do it. Knock? At the gate? Oh, heavens! Spake you not these words, plain? Sirrah, knock me here. Rap me here. Knock me well, and knock me soundly. And come you now with knocking at the gate? Sirrah, be gone, or talk not, I advise you. Petruchio, patience. I am Grumio's pledge. Why, this is a heavy chance twixt him and you, your ancient, trusty, pleasant servant, Grumio. And tell me now, sweet friend, what happy gale blows you to Padua here from old Verona? 
such wind as scatters young men through the world to seek their fortunes farther than at home where small experience grows but in a few senor hortensio thus it stands with me antonio my father is deceased and i have thrust myself into this maze haply to wive and thrive as best i may crowns in my purse i have and goods at home and so am come abroad to see the world petruchio shall i then come roundly to thee and wish thee to a shrewd ill-favoured wife thou'lt thank me but a little for my counsel and yet i promise thee she shall be rich and very rich but thou'rt too much my friend and i'll not wish thee to her Signor Hortensio, twixt such friends as we, few words suffice, and therefore, if thou know, one rich enough to be Petruchio's wife, as wealth is burden of my wooing dance, be she as foul as was Florentius love, as old as Sibyl, and as cursed and shrewd as Socrates Xanthippe, or a worse, she moves me not, or not removes at least, affection's edge in me, were she as rough as are the swelling Adriatic seas, I come to wive it wealthily and Padua. If wealthily, then happily and Padua. Nay, look you, sir, he tells you flatly what his mind is. Why, give him gold enough, and marry him to a puppet, or an aglet baby, or an old trot with ne'er a tooth in her head, though she has as many diseases as two and fifty horses. Why, nothing comes amiss so money comes with all petruchio since we are stepped thus far in i will continue that i broached in jest i can petruchio help thee to a wife with wealth enough and young and beauteous brought up as best becomes a gentlewoman her only fault and that is faults enough is that she is intolerable cursed and shrewd and forward, so beyond all measure, that, were my state far worser than it is, I would not wed her for a mine of gold. Hortensio, peace, thou know'st not gold's effect. Tell me her father's name, and tis enough, for I will board her, though she chide as loud as thunder when the clouds in autumn crack. Her father is Baptista Minola, an affable and courteous gentleman. Her name is Catharina Minola renowned in Padua for her scolding tongue. I know her father, though I know not her, and he knew my deceased father well. I will not sleep, Hortensio, till I see her, and therefore let me be thus bold with you, to give you over at this first encounter, unless you will accompany me thither. I pray you, sir, let him go while the humour lasts. Oh, my word, and she knew him as well as I do, she would think scolding would do little good upon him. She may perhaps call him half a score knaves, or so. Why, that's nothing. And he begin once, he'll rail in his rope tricks. I'll tell you what, sir, and she stand him but a little, he will throw a figure in her face, and so disfigure her with it that she shall have no more eyes to see withal than a cat you know him not sir tarry petruchio i must go with thee for in baptista's keep my treasure is he hath the jewel of my life in hold his youngest daughter beautiful bianca and her withholds for me and other more suits to her and rivals in my love supposing it a thing impossible for those defects i have before rehearsed that ever katharina will be wooed therefore this order hath baptista tang that none shall have access unto bianca till katharine the cursed hath got a husband katharine the cursed a title for a maid of all titles the worst now shall my friend petruchio do me grace and offer me disguised in sober robes to old baptista as a school-teacher well seen in music to instruct bianca that so i may by this device at least have leave and leisure to make love to her and unsuspected court her by herself here's no knavery see to beguile the old folks how the young folks lay their heads together enter gremio and lucentio disguised with books under his arm master master look about you who goes there Ha! Peace, Grumio, tis the rival of my love. 
Petruchio, stand by a while. A proper stripling and an amorous. Oh, very well. I have perused the note. Hark you, sir. I'll have them very fairly bound. All books of love. See that any at hand and see you read no other lectures to her. You understand me. Over and beside Signor Battista's liberality, I'll mend it with a largesse. Take your papers, too, and let me have them very well perfumed, for she is sweeter than perfume itself to whom they go. What will you read to her? Whatever I read to her, I'll plead for you as for my patron, stand you so assured. As firmly as yourself were still in place, yea, and perhaps with more successful words than you, and unless you were a scholar, sir. Oh, this learning, what a thing it is. Oh, this woodcock, what an ass it is. Peace, sirrah. Grumio, mum, God save you, Signor Grumio. And you are well met, Signor Hortensio. Sure you whither I am going. To Battista Manola, I promise to inquire carefully about a schoolmaster for the fair Bianca, and by good fortune I have lighted well on this young man. For learning and behavior fit for her turn, well read in poetry and other books, good ones, I warrant ye. Tis well, and I have met a gentleman hath promised me to help me to another a fine musician to instruct our mistress. So shall I no wit be behind in duty to fair Bianca, so beloved of me. Beloved of me, and that my deeds shall prove. Grumio, aside. <laughs> and that his bags shall prove. Grumio, tis now no time to vent our love. Listen to me, and if you speak me fair, I'll tell you news indifferent good for either. Here is a gentleman whom by chance I met, upon agreement from us to his liking, will undertake to woo cursed Catherine, yea, and to marry her, if her dowry please. So said, so done, is well. Hortensio, have you told him all her faults? I know she is an irksome, brawling scold. If that be all, masters, I hear no harm. No, sayst me so, friend. What countryman? Born in Verona, old Antonio's son, my father dead. My fortune lives for me, and I do hope good days, and long to see. O oh, sir, such a life with such a wife were strange. But if you have a stomach to it in God's name, you shall have me assisting you in all. But will you woo this wildcat? Will I live? Will he woo her? <laughs> I, or I'll hang her. Why came I hither but to that intent? Think you a little din can daunt my ears? Have I not in my time heard lions roar? Have I not heard the sea, puffed up with winds, rage like an angry boar chafed with sweat? Have I not heard great ordnance in the field, and heaven's artillery thunder in the skies? Have I not, in a pitched battle, heard loud larums, neighing steeds and trumpets clang? And do you tell me of a woman's tongue that gives not half so great a blow to hear as will a chestnut in a farmer's fire? Tush, tush! Fear boys with bugs. Grumio aside. <laughs> For he fears none. Hortensio, hark! This gentleman is happily arrived, my mind presumes, for his own good and ours. I promised we would be contributors, and bear his charge of wooing whatsoe'er. And so we will, provided that he win her. I would, I were, as sure of a good dinner. Enter Tranio, bravely apparelled, and Biondello. Gentlemen, God save you. If I may be bold, tell me, I beseech you, which is the readiest way to the house of Signor Baptista Minola? He that has the two fair daughters. Is he you mean? Even he, Biondello? Hark you, sir. You mean not her, too. Perhaps him and her, sir. What have you to do? Not her that chides, sir, at any hand, I pray. I love no chiders, sir. Biondello lets away. Lucentio, aside. Well begun, Tranio. Sir, a word ere you go. Are you a suitor to the maid you talk of, yea or no? And if I be, sir, is it any offence? No, if without more words you will get you hence. Why, sir, I pray, are not the streets as free for me as for you? But so is not she. For what reason, I beseech you? For this reason, if you'll know, that she's the choice love of Signor Gremio. That she's the chosen of Signor Hortensio. Softly, my masters, if you be gentlemen, do me this right. Hear me with patience. Baptista is a noble gentleman, to whom my father is not all unknown. 
And were his daughter fairer than she is, she may more suitors have, and me for one. Fair Leda's daughter had a thousand wooers, then well one more may fair Bianca have. And so she shall. Lucentio shall make one, though Paris came in hope to speed alone. What? This gentleman will out-talk us all. <sighs> Sir, give him head. I, I know he'll prove a jade. Hortensio, to what end are all these words? Sir, let me be so bold as to ask you, did you yet ever see Baptista's daughter? No, sir, but here I do that he hath to, the one as famous for a scolding tongue as is the other for beauteous modesty. Sir, sir, the first for me, let her go by. Yea, leave that labour to great Hercules, and let it be more than Alcides's twelve. Sir, understand you this of me, in sooth, the youngest daughter, whom you hearken for, her father keeps from all access of suitors, and will not promise her to any man, until the elder sister first be wed. The younger, then, is free, and not before. If it be so, sir, that you are the man must stead us all, and me amongst the rest, and if you break the ice and do this feat, achieve the elder, set the younger free for our access, whose hap shall be to have her will not so graceless be to be ingrate. Sir, you say well, and well you do conceive, and since you do profess to be a suitor, you must, as we do, gratify this gentleman to whom we all rest generally beholding. Sir, I shall not be slack. In sign whereof, please ye, we may contrive this afternoon, and quaff carouses to our mistress' health, and do as adversaries do in law, strive mightily, but eat and drink as friends. Oh, excellent motion! Fellows, let's be gone. The motion's good indeed, and be it so. Petruchio, I shall be your benvenuto. Exeunt. End of Act One. Act Two. Scene One. Padua. A room in Baptista's house. Enter Caterina and Bianca. Good sister, wrong me not, nor wrong yourself to make a bondmaid and a slave of me. That I disdain, but for these other gods, unbind my hands, I'll pull them off myself. Yea, all my raiment, to my petticoat, or what you will command me, will I do. So well I know my duty to my elders. Of all thy suitors here, I charge thee tell whom thou lovest best. See thou dissemble not. Believe me, sister, of all the men alive, I never yet beheld that special face which I could fancy more than any other. Minion, thou liest! Is it not Hortensio? If you affect him, sister, here I swear, I'll plead for you myself, but you shall have him. Oh, then belike you fancy riches more. You will have Gremio to keep you fair. Is it for him you do envy me so? Nay, then you jest, and now I well perceive you have but jested with me all this while. I prithee, Sister Kate, untie my hands. If that be jest, then in the rest was so. Strikes her. Enter Baptista. Why, how now, dame, whence grows this insolence? Bianca, stand aside. Poor girl, she weeps. Go ply thy needle. Meddle not with her. For shame, thou hilding of a devilish spirit! Why dost thou wrong her that it ne'er wrong thee? When did she cross thee with a bitter word? Her silence flouts me, and I'll be revenged. Flies after Bianca. What? In my sight? Bianca, get thee in. Exit Bianca. What, will you not suffer me? Nay, now I see she is your treasure. She must have a husband, and I must dance barefoot on her wedding day, and for all your love to her lead apes in hell. Talk not to me. I will go sit and weep till I can find occasion of revenge. Exit. Was ever gentleman thus grieved as I? But who comes here? Enter Gremio, with Lucentio in the habit of a mean man. Petruccio, with Hortensio as a musician, and Tranio, with Biondello bearing a lute and books. Good morrow, neighbor Battista. Good morrow, neighbor Gremio. God save you, gentlemen. And you, good sir, pray, have you not a daughter, called Caterina, fair and virtuous? I have a daughter, sir, called Caterina. You are too blunt. Go to it orderly. You wrong me, Signor Gremio. Give me leave. I am a gentleman of Verona, sir, that, hearing of her beauty and her wit, 
her affability and bashful modesty, her wondrous qualities and mild behavior, am bold to show myself a forward guest within your house, to make mine eyes the witness of that report which I so oft have heard, and for an entrance to my entertainment I do present you with a man of mine. Presenting Hortensio. Cunning in music and the mathematics, to instruct her fully in those sciences, whereof I know she is not ignorant, except of him, or else you do me wrong. His name is Licio, born in Mantua. You are welcome, sir, and he for your good sake. But for my daughter Katrina, this I know she is not for your turn. The more my grief. I see you do not mean to part with her, or else you like not of my company. Mistake me not, I speak but as I find. Whence are you, sir? What may I call your name? Petruchio is my name, Antonio's son a man well known throughout all Italy. I know him well. You are welcome for his sake. Saving your tale, Petruchio, I pray, let us that are poor petitioners speak too. Beccari, you are marvellous forward. Oh, pardon me, Signor Gremio. I would fain be doing. I do not doubt it, sir, but you will curse your wooing. Neighbor, this is a gift very grateful, I am sure of it, to express the like kindness myself that have been more kindly beholding to you than any freely give unto you this young scholar that has long been studying at Reims, as cunning in Greek, Latin, and other languages, as the other in music and mathematics. His name is Cambio. Pray accept his service. Presenting Lucentio. A thousand thanks, Signor Gremio. Welcome, good Cambio. To Tranio. But, gentle sir, methinks you walk like a stranger. May I be so bold to know the cause of your coming? Pardon me, sir, the boldness is mine own, that being a stranger in this city here, do make myself a suitor to your daughter, unto Bianca, fair and virtuous. Nor is your firm resolve unknown to me, in the preferment of the eldest sister. This liberty is all that I request, that, upon knowledge of my parentage, I may have welcome amongst the rest that woo, and free access and favour as the rest and, toward the education of your daughters, I here bestow a simple instrument, and this small packet of Greek and Latin books, if you accept them, then their worth is great. Lucentio is your name, of whence I pray? Of Pisa, sir, son to Vincentio. A mighty man of Pisa, by report I know him well. You are very welcome, sir. To Hortensio. Take you the lute. To Lucentio and you the set of books. You shall go see your pupils presently. Holla, within. Enter a servant. Sirrah, leave these gentlemen to my two daughters, and tell them both these are their tutors. Bid them use them well. Exit servant, with Hortensio, Lucentio, and Biondello. We will go walk a little in the orchard, and then to dinner. You are passing welcome, and so I pray you all to think yourselves. Signor Baptista, my business asketh haste, and every day I cannot come to woo. You knew my father well, and in him me, left solely heir to all his lands and goods, which I have bettered rather than decreased. Then tell me, if I get your daughter's love, what dowry shall I have with her to wife? After my death, the one half of my lands, and in possession twenty thousand crowns. And for that dowry I'll assure her of her widowhood, be it that she survive me, and all my lands and leases whatsoever. Let specialties be therefore drawn between us, that covenants may be kept on either hand. Ay, when the special thing is well obtained, that is, her love, for that is all in all. Why, that is nothing, for I tell you, father, I am as peremptory as she is proud-minded and where two raging fires meet together they do consume the thing that feeds their fury though little fire grows great with little wind yet extreme gusts will blow out fire and all so i to her and so she yields to me for i am rough and woo not like a babe well mayst thou woo and happy be thy speed but be thou armed for some unhappy words ay to the proof as mountains are for winds that shake not, though they blow perpetually. Re-enter Hortensio, with his head broke. How now, my friend, why dost thou look so pale? For fear, I promise you, if I look pale. What, will my daughter prove a good musician? I think she'll sooner prove a soldier. 
Iron may hold with her, but never lutes. Why, then thou canst not break her to the lute? Why, no, for she hath broke the lute to me. I did but tell her she mistook her frets, and bowed her hand to teach her fingering, when, with the most impatient, devilish spirit, Frets, you call these, quoth she, I'll fume with them. And with that word she struck me on the head, and through the instrument my pate made way, and there I stood amazed for a while as on a pillory looking through the lute, while she did call me rascal fiddler and twangling jack with twenty such vile terms as she has studied to misuse me so. Now, by the world, it is a lusty wench. I love her ten times more than e'er I did. Oh, how I long to have some chat with her. Baptista, to Hortensio. Well, go with me, and be not so discomfited. Proceed and practice with my younger daughter. She's apt to learn and thankful for good turns. Signor Petruccio, will you go with us, or shall I send my daughter Kate to you? I pray you do. I will attend her here. Exeunt Baptista, Gremio, Tranio, and Hortensio. And woo her with some spirit when she comes. Say that she rail. Why, then, I'll tell her plain. She sings as sweetly as a nightingale. Say that she frown. I'll say she looks as clear as morning roses newly washed with dew. Say she be mute and will not speak a word. Then I'll commend her volubility and say she uttereth piercing eloquence. If she do bid me pack, I'll give her thanks, as though she bid me stay by her a week. If she deny to wed, I'll crave the day, when I shall ask the bands, and when be married. But here she comes, and now, Petruchio, speak. Enter Caterina. Good morrow, Kate, for that's your name, I hear. Well have you heard, but something hard of hearing. They call me Catherine that do talk of me. You lie, in faith, for you are called plain Kate, and bonny Kate, and sometimes Kate the cursed, but Kate, the prettiest Kate in Christendom, Kate of my Kate Hall, my super dainty Kate, for dainties are all Kates, and therefore Kate, take this of me, Kate of my consolation, hearing thy mildness praised in every town, thy virtues spoke of, and thy beauty sounded, yet not so deeply as to thee belongs, myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. Moved in good time. Let him that moved you hither remove you hence. I knew you at the first. You were immovable. Why? What's immovable? A joint stool. Thou hast hit it. Come, sit on me. Asses are made to bear, and so are you. Women are made to bear, and so are you. No such jade as bear you, if me you mean. Alas, good Kate, I will not burden thee. For, knowing thee to be but young and light— too light for such a swain as you to catch, and yet as heavy as my weight should be. Should be. Should buzz. Well tain and like a buzzard. O oh, slow-winged turtle, shall a buzzard take thee? Ay, for a turtle as he takes a buzzard. Come, come, you wasp. If faith, you are too angry. If I be waspish, best beware my sting. My remedy is, then, to pluck it out. Ay, if the fool could find it where it lies. Who knows not where a wasp does wear his sting? In his tail. In his tongue. Whose tongue? Yours, if you talk of tails, and so farewell. What? With my tongue and your tail? Nay, come again. Good Kate, I am a gentleman. That I'll try. Striking him. I swear I'll cuff you if you strike again. So may you lose your arms. If you strike me, you are no gentleman. And if no gentleman, why then no arms? A herald, Kate? Oh, put me in thy books. What is your crest, a coxcomb? A combless cock. So Kate will be my hen. No cock of mine you crow to like a craven. Nay, come, Kate, come. You must not look so sour. It is my fashion when I see a crab. Why, here's no crab, and therefore look not sour. There is. There is. Then show it to me. Had I a glass, I would. What? You mean my face? Well aimed of such a young one. Now, by St. George, I am too young for you. Yet you are withered. Tis with cares. I care not. Nay, hear you, Kate. In sooth, you scape not so. I chafe you if I tarry. Let me go. No, not a whit. I find you passing gentle. Twas told me you were rough, and coy, and sullen, and now I find report a very liar. For thou art pleasant, gamesome, 
passing courteous, but slow in speech, yet sweet as springtime flowers, thou canst not frown, thou canst not look askance, nor bite the lip, as angry wenches will, nor hast thou pleasure to be cross in talk, but thou with mildness entertained thy wooers, with gentle conference, soft and affable. Why does the world report that Kate doth limp? O slanderous world! Kate, like the hazel twig, is straight and slender, and as brown in hue as hazelnuts, and sweeter than the kernels. Oh, let me see thee walk. Thou dost not halt. Go, fool, in whom thou keep'st command. Did ever Diane so become a grove, as Kate, this chamber, with her princely gait? Oh, be thou Diane, and let her be Kate, and then let Kate be chaste, and Diane sportful. Where did you study all this goodly speech? It is extempore, from my mother wit. A witty mother, witless else her son. Am I not wise? Yes, keep you warm. Mary, so I mean, sweet Catherine, in thy bed, and therefore setting all this chat aside, thus in plain terms your father hath consented that you shall be my wife, your dowry agreed on. And will you, nil you, I will marry you. Now, Kate, I am a husband for your turn. For, by this light, whereby I see thy beauty, thy beauty that doth make me like thee well, thou must be married to no man but me. For I am he am born to tame you, Kate, and bring you from a wild Kate to a Kate conformable as other household Kates. Here comes your father. Never make denial. I must and will have Catherine to my wife. Re-enter Baptista, Gremio, and Tranio. Now, Signor Petruccio, how speed you with my daughter? How but well, sir? How but well? It were impossible I should speed amiss. Why, how now, daughter Catherine? In your dumps? Call you me daughter. Now I promise you, you have showed a tender fatherly regard to wish me wed to one half lunatic, a madcap ruffian, and a swearing jack that thinks with oaths to face the matter out. Father, tis thus. Yourself and all the world that talked of her have talked amiss of her. If she be cursed, it is for policy, for she is not froward, but modest as the dove. She is not hot, but temperate as the morn. For patience she will prove a second gristle, and Roman Lucrece for her chastity. And to conclude, we have agreed so well together that upon Sunday is the wedding day. I'll see thee hanged on Sunday first. Hark, Petruchio, she says she'll see thee hanged first. Is this your speeding? Nay, then good night our part. Be patient, gentlemen. I choose her for myself. If she and I be pleased, what's that to you? Tis bargain twixt us twain, being alone, that she shall still be cursed in company. I tell you, tis incredible to believe how much she loves me. Oh, the kindest Kate, she hung about my neck, and kiss on kiss she vied so fast, protesting oath on oath, that in a twink she won me to her love. Oh, you are novices, tis a world to see, how tame when men and women are alone, a meacock wretch can make the cursedest shrew. Give me thy hand, Kate, I will unto Venice, to buy apparel against the wedding day, Provide the feast, father, and bid the guests. I will be sure my Catherine shall be fine. I know not what to say, but give me your hands. God send you joy, Petruccio. Tis a match. Amen, say we. We will be witnesses. Father and wife and gentlemen, adieu. I will to Venice. Sunday comes apace. We will have rings and things and fine array. And kiss me, Kate. We will be married a Sunday. Excellent Petruccio and Caterina, severally. Was ever a match clapped up so suddenly? Faith, gentlemen, now I play a merchant's part, and venture madly on a desperate mart. Twas a commodity lay fretting by you. Twill bring you gain or perish on the seas. The gain I seek is quiet in the match. No doubt but he hath got a quiet catch. But now, Battista, to your younger daughter, now is the day we long have looked for. I am your neighbor, and was suitor first. And I am one that love Bianca more than words can witness or your thoughts can guess. Youngling, thou canst not love so dear as I. Greybeard, thy love doth freeze. 
But thine doth fry. Skipper, stand back. Tis age that nourisheth. But youth in ladies' eyes that flourisheth. Content you, gentlemen, I'll compound this strife. Tis deeds must win the prize, and he of both that can assure my daughter greatest dower shall have my Bianca's love. Say, Signor Gremio, what can you assure her? First, as you know, my house within the city is richly furnished with plate and gold, basins and ewers to lave her dainty hands, my hangings all of Tyrian tapestry. In ivory coffers I have stuffed my crowns, in cypress chests my arras counterpoints, costly apparel, tents and canopies, fine linens, turkey cushions bossed with pearl, balance of Venice gold and needlework, pewter and brass, and all things that belong to house or housekeeping. Then at my farm I have six hundred milk kind to the pail, six score fat oxen standing in my stalls, and all things answerable to this portion. Myself am stuck in years, I must confess, and if I die to-morrow, this is hers. If whilst I live, she will be only mine. That only came well in. Sir, list to me. I am my father's heir and only son. If I may have your daughter to my wife, I'll leave her houses three or four as good within rich Pisa's walls as any one old Signor Gremio has in Padua. Besides two thousand ducats by the year of fruitful land, all which shall be her jointure. What, have I pinched you, Signor Gremio? Two thousand ducats by year of land. My land amounts not to so much in all that she shall have, besides an argosy that now lies in Marseilles' road. What, have I choked you with an argosy? Gremio, tis known my father hath no less than three great argosies, besides two galleuses and twelve tight galleys. These I will assure her, and twice as much, whate'er thou offers next. Nay, I have offered all, I have no more. And she can have no more than all I have. If you like me, she shall have me and mine. Why, then, the maid is mine from all the world by your firm promise. Gremio is outvied. I must confess your offer is the best, and let your father make her the assurance. She is your own, else you must pardon me. If you should die before him, where's her dower? That's but a cavil. He is old, I young. And may not young men die as well as old? Well, gentlemen, I am thus resolved. On Sunday next, you know, my daughter Catherine is to be married. Now, on the Sunday following, shall Bianca be bride to you, if you make this assurance, if not to Signor Gremio. And so I take my leave, and thank you both. Adieu, good neighbor. Exit Baptista. Now I fear thee not, sirrah, young gamester. Your father were a fool to give thee all, and in his waning age set foot under thy table. Tut, a toy. An old Italian fox is not so kind, my boy. Exit. A vengeance on your crafty, withered hide. Yet I have faced it with a card of ten. Tis in my head to do my master good. I see no reason but supposed De Lucencio must get a father called supposed Vincencio. And that's a wonder. Fathers commonly do get their children. But in this case of wooing, a child shall get a sire, if I fail not of my cunning. Exit. End of Act Two. Act Three. Scene One. Padua. A room in Baptista's house. Enter Lucencio, Hortensio, and Bianca. Fiddler, forbear! You've grown too forward, sir. Have you so soon forgot the entertainment her sister Catherine welcomed you withal? But, wrangling pedant, this is the patroness of heavenly harmony. Then give me leave to have prerogative, and when in music we have spent an hour, your lecture shall have leisure for as much. Preposterous ass, that never read so far to know the cause why music was ordained. Was it not to refresh the mind of man after his studies or his usual pain? Then give me leave to read philosophy, and while I pause, serve in your harmony. Sirrah, I will not bear these braves of thine. Why, gentlemen, you do me double wrong to strive for that which resteth in my choice. I am no breaching scholar in the schools. I'll not be tied to hours nor appointed times, but learn my lessons as I please myself. 
And to cut off all strife, here, sit we down, take you your instrument, play you the wiles. His lecture will be done ere you have tuned. You'll leave his lecture when I am in tune? Retires. Ah, that will be never. Tune your instrument. Where left we last? Here, madam. Um, hic ibad simois, hic est sigea telus, hic stetirat priami regia celsa senis. Construe them. Um, hic ibat, as I told you before, Simois, I am Lucentio, hic est, son unto Vincentio of Pisa, uh, Sigea Telus, uh, disguised thus to get your love. Uh, hic staterat, and that Lucentio that comes a wooing, uh, Priami, is my man, Tranio, uh, Regia, bearing my port. Celsusenis, that we might beguile the old pantaloon. Hortensio, returning. Uh, madam, my instrument's in tune. Let's hear. Hortensio plays. Oh, fie, the treble jars. Oh, spit in the hole, man, and tune again. Now, let me see if I can construe it. Ehek <clears throat> ebat simois, I know you not. Hic est sigea telus, I trust you not. Hic steterat pri ami, take heed ye hear us not. Regea, presume not. Celsa senis, despair not. Madam, <laughs> tis now in tune. Oh, how but the bass? The bass is right, tis the bass knave that jars. How fiery and forward our pedant is! Aside. Now for my life the knave doth court my love. Pevescule, I'll watch you better yet. In time I may believe, yet I mistrust. Mistrust it not, for sure. The Acides was Ajax, called so from his grandfather. I must believe my master, else I promise you I should be arguing still upon that doubt. But let it rest. Now, Licio, to you, good master, take it not unkindly, pray, that I have been thus pleasant with you both. Hortensio, to Lucentio. You may go walk and leave me a while. My lessons make no music in three parts. How are you so formal, sir? Aside. Well, I must wait, and watch withal, for but I be deceived, our fine musician groweth amorous. Madam, before you touch the instrument to learn the order of my fingering, I must begin with rudiments of art to teach you gamut in a briefer sort, more pleasant, pithy, and effectual, than hath been taught by any of my trade. And there it is in writing, fairly drawn. Why, I am past my gamut long ago. Yet read the gamut of Hortensio. Gamut. I am the ground of all accord, a, re, to plead Hortensio's passion, b, me, Bianca, take him for thy lord, c, fa, ut, that loves with all affection, d, sol, re, one clef, two notes have I, e, la, mi, Show pity or I die? Call you this gamut. Tut, I like it not. Old fashions please me best. I am not so nice to change true rules for odd inventions. Enter a servant. Mistress, your father prays you leave your books and help to dress your sister's chamber up. You know, tomorrow is the wedding day. Farewell, sweet masters both. I, I must be gone. Exeunt Bianca and servant. Faith, mistress, that I have no cause to stay. Exit. But I have cause to pry into this pedant. Methinks he looks as though he were in love. Yet if thy thoughts, Bianca, be so humble, To cast thy wandering eyes on every stale, Seize thee that list. If once I find thee ranging, Hortensio will be quit with thee by changing. Exit. Scene two. The same. Before Baptista's house. Enter Baptista, Gremio, Tranio, Caterina, Bianca, Lucentio, and attendants. 
Baptista, Tutranio. Signor Lucencio, this is the point of day that Catherine and Petruccio shall be married, and yet we hear not of our son-in-law. What will be said? What mockery will it be to want the bridegroom when the priest attends to speak the ceremonial rites of marriage? What says Lucentio to this shame of ours? No shame but mine. I must, forsooth, be forced to give my hand opposed against my heart unto a mad brain Rudesby, full of spleen, who wooed in haste and means to wed at leisure. I told you, I, he was a frantic fool, hiding his bitter jests and blunt behaviour, and to be noted for a merry man. He'll woo a thousand, point the day of marriage, make friends invited, and proclaim the bans, yet never means to wed where he hath wooed. Now must the world point at poor Catherine, and say, Lo, there is mad Petruchio's wife, if it would please him come and marry her. Patience, good Catherine, and Baptista too. Upon my life Petruchio means but well. Whatever fortune stays him from his word, though he be blunt, I know him passing wise. Though he be merry, yet with all he's honest. Would Catherine had never seen him, though. Exit, weeping, followed by Bianca and others. Go, girl, I cannot blame thee now to weep, for such an injury would vex a very saint, much more a shoe of thy impatient humour. Enter Biondello. Master, master, news, old news, and such news as you never heard of. Is it new and old too? How may that be? Why is it not news to hear of Petruchio's coming? Is he come? Why, no, sir. What then? He is coming. When will he be here? When he stands where I am and sees you there. But say, what to thine old news? Why, Petruchio is coming, in a new hat, and an old jerkin, a pair of old breeches thrice turned, a pair of boots that have been candle cases, one buckled, another laced, an old rusty sword ta'en out of the town armoury, with a broken hilt, and chapeless, with two broken points, his horse hipped with an old mothy saddle, and stirrups of no kindred, besides possessed with the glanders and like to mose in the chine, troubled with the lampus, infected with the fashions, full of wingles, sped with spavins, rayed with the yellows, past cure of the fives, stark spoiled with the staggers, be gnawn with the bots, swayed in the back and shoulder shotten, near legged before, and with a half checked bit, and a head stall of sheep's leather, which being restrained to keep him from stumbling, hath been often burst, and now repaired with knots, one girth six times pierced, and a woman's crupper of velour, which hath two letters for her name fairly set down in studs, and here and there pierced with pack thread. Who comes with him? Oh, sir, his lackey, for all the world comparisons like the horse, with a linen stock on one leg, and a cursy boot hose on the other, gartered with a red and blue list, an old hat, and the humour of forty fancies pricked int for a feather, a monster, a very monster in apparel, and not like a Christian footboy or a gentleman's lackey. Tis some odd humour pricks him to this fashion, yet oftentimes lie goes but mean apparelled. I'm glad he's come, howsoe'er he comes. Why, sir, he comes not. Didst thou not say he comes? Who? That Petruchio came? Ay, that Petruchio came. No, sir, I say his horse comes, with him on his back. Why, that's all one. Nay, by St. Jamie, I hold you a penny. A horse and a man is more than one, and yet not many. Enter Petruchio and Grumio. Come, where be these gallants? Who is at home? You are welcome, sir. And yet I come not well. And yet you hold not? Not so well apparelled as I wish you were. Were it better, I should rush in thus. But where is Kate? Where is my lovely bride? How does my father? And wherefore gaze this goodly company? As if they saw some wondrous monument, some comet, or unusual prodigy. Why, sir, you know this is your wedding day. First were we sad, fearing you would not come. Now sadder that you come so unprovided. Fie, doff this habit, shame to your estate, an eyesore to our solemn festival. And tell us what occasion of import hath all so long detained you from your wife, and sent you hither so unlike yourself. Tedious it were to tell, and harsh to hear. Sufficeth. I am come to keep my word, though in some part enforced 
to digress, which at more leisure I will so excuse, as you shall well be satisfied withal. But where is Kate? I stay too long from her. The morning wears, tis time we were at church. See not your bride in these unreverent robes. Go to my chamber, put on clothes of mine. Not I, believe me. Thus I'll visit her. But thus I trust you will not marry her. Good sooth, even thus. Therefore have done with words. To me she's married, not unto my clothes. Could I repair what she will wear in me, as I can change these poor accoutrements? Twere well for Kate, and better for myself. But what a fool am I to chat with you, when I should bid good morrow to my bride, and seal the title with a lovely kiss. Exeunt Petruccio, Grumio, and Biondello. He hath some meaning in his mad attire. We will persuade him, be it possible, to put on better ere he go to church. I'll after him, and see the event of this. Exeunt Baptista, Gremio, and attendants. But to her love concerneth us to add her father's liking, which to bring to pass, as I before imparted to your worship, I am to get a man. Whate'er he be, it skills not much, will fit him to our turn, and he shall be Vincencio of Pisa, and make assurance here in Padua of greater sums than I have promised. So shall you quietly enjoy your hope, and marry sweet Bianca with consent. Were it not that my fellow schoolmaster doth watch Bianca's steps so narrowly, it were good methinks to steal our marriage, which once performed, let all the world say no, I'll keep mine own, despite of all the world. That by degrees we mean to look into, and watch our vantage in this business. We'll overreach the greybeard, Gremio, the narrow prying father, Minilla, the quaint musician, amorous Licio, all for my master's sake, Lucencio. Re-enter Gremio. Signor Gremio, came you from the church? As willingly as e'er I came from school. And is the bride and bridegroom coming home? A bridegroom, say you. Tis a groom indeed, a grumbling groom, and that the girl shall find... Cursed her than she! Why, tis impossible! Why, he's a devil, a devil, a very fiend! Why, she's a devil, a devil, the devil's dam! Tut, she's a lamb, a dove, a fool to him! I'll tell you, Sir Lucentio, when the priest should ask if Catherine should be his wife, I by God's wounds, quoth he, and swore so loud that, all amazed, the priest let fall the book. And as he stooped again to take it up, the mad-brained bridegroom took him such a cuff that down fell the priest and book, and book and priest. Now take them up, quoth he, if any list. What said the wench when he rose again? Trembled and shook, for why he'd stamped and swore as if the vicar meant to cozen him. But after many ceremonies done, he calls for wine. A health, quoth he as if he had been abroad, carousing to his mates after a storm, quaffed off the muscadel and threw the sops all in the sexton's face, having no other reason but that his beard grew thin and hungrily, and seemed to ask him sops as he was drinking. This done, he took the bride about the neck and kissed her lips with such a clamorous smack that at the parting all the church did echo. And I, seeing this, came thence for very shame, and after me I know the rout is coming. Such a mad marriage never was before. Hark, hark, I hear the minstrels play. Enter Petruccio, Caterina, Bianca, Baptista, Hortensio, Grumio, and Train. Gentlemen and friends, I thank you for your pains. I know you think to dine with me today, and have prepared great store of wedding cheer. But so it is, my haste doth call me hence, and therefore here I mean to take my leave. Is it possible you will away to-night? I must away to-day before night come. Make it no wonder. If you knew my business, you would entreat me rather go than stay. And, honest company, I thank you all that have beheld me give away myself to this most patient, sweet, and virtuous wife. Dine with my father, drink a health to me, for I must hence, and farewell to you all. Let us entreat you stay till after dinner. It may not be. Let me entreat you. It cannot be. Let me entreat you. I am content. Are you content to stay? I am content you shall entreat me stay, but yet not stay. Entreat me how you can. Now, if you love me, stay. Grumio, my horse. Aye, sir. They be ready. The oats have eaten the horses. Nay, then, do what thou canst. 
I will not go to-day. No, nor to-morrow, not till I please myself. The door is open, sir, there lies your way. You may be jogging while your boots are green. For me, I'll not be gone till I please myself. Tis like you'll prove a jolly surly groom, that take it on you at the first so roundly. O oh, Kate, content thee. Prithee, be not angry. I will be angry. What hast thou to do? Father, be quiet. He shall stay my leisure. Ay, merry, sir. Now it begins to work. Gentlemen, forward to the bridal dinner. I see a woman may be made a fool, if she had not a spirit to resist. They shall go forward, Kate, at thy command. Obey the bride, you that attend on her. Go to the feast, revel and domineer. Carouse full measure to her maidenhead. Be mad and merry, or go hang yourselves. But for my bonny Kate, she must with me. Nay, look not big, nor stamp, nor stare, nor fret. I will be master of what is mine own. She is my goods, my chattels, she is my house. My household stuff, my field, my barn, my horse, my ox, my ass, my anything. And here she stands. Touch her, whoever dare. I'll bring mine action on the proudest he that stops my way in Padua. Grumio. Draw forth thy weapon. We are beset with thieves. Rescue thy mistress, if thou be a man. Fear not, sweet wench. They shall not touch thee, Kate. I'll buckler thee against a million. Exeunt Petruccio, Caterina, and Grumio. Nay, let them go. A couple of quiet ones. Went they not quickly, I should die with laughing. Of all mad matches, never was the like. Uh, mistress? What's your opinion of your sister? Being mad herself, she's madly mated. I warrant him, Petruchio is cated. Neighbors and friends, though bride and bridegroom wants for to supply the places at the table, you know there wants no junkets at the feast. Lucentio, you shall supply the bridegroom's place, and let Bianca take her sister's room. Shall sweet Bianca practice how to bride it? She shall, Lucentio. Come, gentlemen, let's go. Excellent. End of Act 3. Act 4. Scene 1. A hall in Petruchio's country house. Enter Grumio. Fie! Fie on all tired jades, on all mad masters, and all foul ways. Was ever man so beaten? Was ever man so rayed? Was ever man so weary? I am sent before to make a fire, and they are coming after to warm them. Now, were not I a little pot, and soon hot, my very lips might freeze to my teeth, my tongue to the roof of my mouth, my heart in my belly, ere I should come by a fire to thaw me. But I, with blowing the fire, shall warm myself, for, considering the weather, a taller man than I will take cold. Hola! Ho! Curtis! Enter Curtis. Who is that that calls so coldly? A piece of ice. If thou doubt it, thou mayst slide from my shoulder to my heel with no greater a run but my head and my neck. A fire, good Curtis. Is my master and his wife coming, Grumio? Oh, ay, Curtis, ay, and therefore fire, fire, cast on no water. Is she so hot a shrew as she reported? She was, good Curtis, before this frost. But thou knowest, winter tames man, woman, and beast, for it hath tamed my old master and my new mistress and myself, fellow Curtis. Away, you three-inch fool, I am no beast. Am I but three inches? Why, thy horn is a foot, and so long am I, at the least. But wilt thou make a fire, or shall I complain on thee to our mistress, whose hand, she being now at hand, thou shalt soon feel to thy cold comfort, for being so slow in thy hot office. I prithee, good Grumio, tell me, how goes the world? A cold 
loved world, Curtis, in every office but thine, and therefore fire, do thy duty, and have thy duty, for my master and mistress are almost frozen to death. There's fire ready, and therefore, good Grumio, the news? Why, Jack boy, ho boy, and as much news as thou wilt. Come, you are so full of coney-catching. Why, therefore, fire, for I have caught extreme cold. Where's the cook? Is supper ready? The house trimmed, rushes strewed, cobwebs swept, the serving men and their new fustian, their white stockings, and every officer his wedding garment on. Be the jacks fair within, the jills fair without, and carpets laid, and everything in order. All ready, and therefore I pray thee, news? First, know my horse is tired my master and mistress fallen out how out of their saddles into the dirt and thereby hangs a tale let's hot good grumio lend thine ear here there this tis to feel a tale not to hear a tale and therefore is called a sensible tale and this cuff was but to knock at your car and beseech listening now I begin. In Primus, we came down a foul hill, my master riding behind my mistress. Both of one horse? What's that to thee? Why a horse? Tell thou the tale. But hadst thou not crossed me, thou shouldst have heard how her horse fell, and she under her horse. Thou shouldst have heard in how miry a place how she was bemoiled, how he left her with the horse upon her, how he beat me because her horse stumbled, how she waded through the dirt to pluck him off me, how he swore, how she prayed that never prayed before, how I cried, how the horses ran away, how her bridle was burst, how I lost my crupper, with many things of worthy memory, which now shall die in oblivion, and thou return unexperienced to thy grave. By this reckoning he is more shrew than she. Ay, and that thou and the proudest of you all shall find when he comes home. But what talk I of this? Call forth Nathaniel, Joseph, Nicholas, Philip, Walter, Sugarsop, and the rest. Let their heads be sleekly combed, their blue coats brushed, and their garters of an indifferent knit. Let them curtsy with their left legs, and not presume to touch a hair of my master's horse-tail till they kiss their hands. Are they all ready? They are. Call them forth. Do you hear? Ho! You must be my master. To countenance my mistress. Why, she hath a face of her own. Who knows not that? Thou, it seems, that calls for company to countenance her. I call them forth to credit her. Why, she comes to borrow nothing of them. Enter several servants. Welcome home, Grumio. How now, Grumio? What? Grumio? Fellow Grumio. How now, old lad? Welcome, you. How now, you? What, you? Fellow, you. And thus much for greeting. Now, my spruce companions, is all ready, and all things neat? All things is ready. How near is our master? E'en at hand, alighted by this, and therefore be not. Cock's passion, silence, I hear my master. Enter Petruccio and Caterina. Where be these knaves? What, no man at door, to hold my stirrup, nor to take my horse? Where is Nathaniel, Gregory, Philip? Here, sir. Here, sir. Here, sir. Here, sir. Here, sir. You logger-headed and unpolished grooms. What, no attendance, no regard, no duty? Where is the foolish knave I sent before? Here, sir, 
as foolish as I was before. You peasant swain, you horse and malt horse dredge, did I not bid thee meet me in the park, and bring along these rascal knaves with thee? Nathaniel's coat, sir, was not fully made, and Gabriel's pumps were all unpinked in the heel. There was no link to colour Peter's hat, and Walter's dagger was not come from sheathing. There was none fine but Adam, Ralph, and Gregory. The rest were ragged, old, and beggarly. Yet as they are, here are they come to meet you. Go, rascals, go, and fetch my supper in. Exeunt some of the servants. Where is the life that late I led? Where are those? Sit down, Kate, and welcome. Sod, 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 sod. Re-enter servants with supper. Why, when I say, Nay, good sweet Kate, be merry. Off with my boots, you rogues, you villains, when? It was the friar of orders gray, as he forth walked on his way. Out, you rogue, you pluck my foot awry. Take that, and mend the plucking off the other. Be merry, Kate. Some water, here. What ho? Where's my spaniel, Troilus? Sirrah, get you hence, and bid my cousin Ferdinand come hither. Exit servant. One, Kate, that you must kiss and be acquainted with. Where are my slippers? Shall I have some water? Come, Kate, and wash, and welcome heartily. Servant lets the ewer fall. Petruchio strikes him. You horse son villain, will you let it fall? Patience, I pray you, t'was a fault unwilling. A whoreson, beetle-headed, flap-eared knave. Come, Kate, sit down, I know you have a stomach. Will you give thanks, sweet Kate, or else shall I? What's this, mutton? I. Who brought it? I. Tis burnt, and so is all the meat. What dogs are these? Where is the rascal cook? How durst you villains? Bring it from the dresser, and serve it thus to me that love it not? Throws the meat, etc., at them. There, take it to you, trenchers, cups, and all, you heedless jolt-heads and unmannered slaves. What? Do you grumble? I'll be with you straight. I pray you, husband, be not so disquiet. The meat was well if you were so contented. I tell thee, Kate, t'was burnt and dried away and I expressly am forbid to touch it, for it engenders choler, planteth anger, and better twere that both of us did fast, since of ourselves, ourselves are choleric, than feed it with such over-roasted flesh. Be patient, to-morrow it shall be mended, and for this night will fast for company. Come, I will bring thee to thy bridal chamber. Exeunt Petruchio, Caterina, and Curtis Peter, didst ever see the like? He kills her in her own humor. Re-enter Curtis. Where is he? In her chamber, making a sermon of contency to her, and rails, and swears, and rates, that she, poor soul, knows not which way to stand, to look, to speak, and sits as one new risen from a dream. Away, away, for he is coming hither. Excellent. Re-enter Petruchio. Thus have I politically begun my reign, and tis my hope to end successfully. My falcon now is sharp and passing empty, and till she stoop she must not be full-gorged, for then she never looks upon her lure. Another way I have to man my haggard, to make her come, and know her keeper's call, that is, to watch her, as we watch these kites that bait and beat, and will not be obedient. She eats no meat to-day, nor none shall eat. Last night she slept not, nor to-night she shall not. As with the meat, some undeserved fault I'll find about the making of the bed, and here I'll fling the pillow, there the bolster, this way the coverlet, another way the sheets. Ay, and amid this hurly I intend that all is done in reverend care of her, and in conclusion she shall watch all night, and if she chance to nod i'll rail and brawl and with the clamour keep her still awake this is a way to kill a wife with kindness and thus i'll curb her mad and headstrong humour 
he that knows better how to tame a shrew now let him speak tis charity to show exit scene two padua before baptista's house enter tranio and hortensio is't possible friend licio that mistress bianca doth fancy any other but lucencio i tell you sir she bears me fair in hand sir to satisfy you in what i have said stand by and mark the manner of his teaching they stand aside enter bianca and lucencio now mistress uh, profit you in what you read what master read you first resolve me that i read that i profess uh the art to love and may you prove sir master of your art while you sweet dear prove mistress of my heart they retire quick proceeders marry now tell me i pray you that durst swear that your mistress bianca loved none in the world so well as lucentio oh despiteful love unconstant womankind i tell thee licio this is wonderful make no mistake i am not licio nor a musician as i seem to be but one that scorn to live in this disguise for such a one as leaves a gentleman and makes a god of such a cullion know sir that i am called hortensio signor hortensio i have often heard of your entire affection to bianca and since mine eyes are witness of her likeness I will with you, if you be so contented, forswear Bianca and her love for ever. See how they kiss and court. Signor Lucentio, here is my hand, and here I firmly vow never to woo her more, but do forswear her as one unworthy all the former favours, that I have fondly flattered her withal. And here I take the like unfeigned oath, never to marry with her, though she would entreat. Fie on her! See how beastly she doth court him! <laughs> would all the world but he had quite forsworn for me that i may surely keep mine oath i will be married to a wealthy widow ere three days pass which hath as long loved me as i have loved this proud disdainful haggard and so farewell signor lucentio kindness in women not their beauteous looks shall win my love and so i take my leave in resolution as i swore before Exit Hortensio. Lucentio and Bianca advance. Mistress Bianca, bless you with such grace as longeth to a lover's blessed case. Nay, I have ta'en you napping, gentle love, and have forsworn you with Hortensio. Tranio, you jest. But have you both forsworn me? Mistress, we have. Then we are rid of Licio. If faith, he'll have a lusty widow now that shall be wooed and wedded in a day. God give him joy. Ay, and he'll tame her. He says so, Tranio. Faith, he is gone unto the taming school. The taming school? What, is there such a place? Ay, mistress, and Petruchio is the master, that teacheth tricks eleven and twenty long, to tame a shrew and charm her chattering tongue. Enter Biondello, running. O oh, master, master, I have watched so long that I am dog-weary, but at last I spied an ancient angel coming down the hill will serve the turn. What is he, Biondello? Master, a mercantante, or a pedant, I know not what, but formal in apparel, in gait and countenance, surely like a father. And what of him, Tranio? If he be credulous and trust my tale, I'll make him glad to seem Vincentio, and give assurance to Baptista Minola, as if he were the right Vincentio. Take in your love, and then let me alone. Exeunt Lucentio and Bianca. Enter a pedant. God save you, sir. And you, sir, you are welcome. Travel you far on, or are you at the farthest? Sir, at the farthest for a week or two, but then up farther, and as far as Rome, and so to Tripoli if god lend me life what countrymen i pray of mantua of mantua sir marry god forbid and come to padua careless of your life my life sir how i pray that goes hard tis death for any one in mantua to come to padua know you not the cause your ships are stayed at venice and the duke for private quarrel twixt your duke and him hath published and proclaimed it openly tis marvel 
But that you are but newly come, you might have heard it else proclaimed about. Alas, sir, it is worse for me than so, for I have bills for money by exchange from Florence, and must here deliver them. Well, sir, to do you courtesy, this will I do, and this I will advise you. First tell me, have you ever been at Pisa? Ay, sir, in Pisa have I often been, Pisa renowned for grave citizens. Among them know you one Vincenzio? I know him not, but I have heard of him, merchant of incomparable wealth. He is my father, sir, and, sooth to say, in countenance somewhat doth resemble you. Biondello, aside. As much as an apple doth an oyster, and all one. To save your life in this extremity, this favour will I do you for his sake, and think it not the worst of all your fortunes that you are like to Sir Vincenzio. His name and credit shall you undertake, and in my house you shall be friendly lodged. Look that you take upon you as you should. You understand me, sir, so shall you stay till you have done your business in the city. If this be courtesy, sir, accept of it. Oh, sir, I do, and will repute you ever the patron of my life and liberty. Then go with me to make the matter good. This, by the way, I let you understand. My father is here looked for every day to pass assurance of a dower in marriage twixt me and one Baptista's daughter here. In all these circumstances I'll instruct you. Go with me to clothe you as becomes you. Excellent. Scene three. A room in Petruccio's house. Enter Caterina and Grumio. No, no, forsooth. I dare not, for my life. The more my wrong, the more his spite appears. What, did he marry me to famish me? Beggars that come unto my father's door upon entreaty have a present alms. If not, elsewhere they meet with charity. But I, who never knew how to entreat, nor never needed that I should entreat, am starved for meat, giddy for lack of sleep, with oaths kept waking, and with brawling fed. And that which spites me more than all these wants, he does it under name of perfect love. As who should say, if I should sleep or eat, t'were deadly sickness, or else present death, I prithee go and get me some repast. I care not what, so it be wholesome food. What say you to a neat's foot? Tis passing good. I prithee let me have it. I fear it is too choleric a meat. How say you to a fat tripe, finely broiled? I like it well, good Grumio. Fetch it me. I cannot tell. I fear tis choleric. What say you to a piece of beef and mustard? A dish that I do love to feed upon. Ay, but the mustard is too hot a little. Why, then the beef, and let the mustard rest. Nay, then I will not, and you shall have the mustard, or else you get no beef of Grumio. Then both, or one, or anything thou wilt. Why, then, the mustard without the beef. Beats him. Go. Get thee gone, thou false, deluding slave, that feeds me with the very name of meat, sorrow on thee and all the pack of you that triumph thus upon my misery. Go, get thee gone, I say. Enter Petruccio with a dish of meat, and Hortensio. How fares my Kate? What seating all amort? Mistress, what cheer? Faith as cold as can be. Pluck up thy spirits, look cheerfully upon me. Here, love, thou seest how diligent I am to dress thy meat myself, and bring it thee. Sets the dish on a table. I am sure, sweet Kate, this kindness merits thanks. What, not a word? Nay, then thou lovest not. And all my pains is sorted to no proof. Here, take away this dish. I pray you let it stand. The poorest service is repaid with thanks, and so shall mine before you touch the meat. I thank you, sir. Signor Petruchio, fie, you are to blame. Come, Mistress Kate, I'll bear you company. Petruchio, aside. Eat it all up, Hortensio, if thou lovest me. Much good do it unto thy gentle heart. Kate, eat apace, and now, my honey love, will we return unto thy father's house, and revel it as bravely as the best, with silken coats and caps and golden rings, with ruffs and cuffs and farthingales and things, with scarfs and fans and double change of bravery, with amber bracelets, beads, and all this knavery. What, hast thou dined? The tailor stays thy leisure 
to deck thy body with his ruffling treasure. Enter Taylor. Come, Taylor, let us see these ornaments. Lay forth the gown. Enter Haberdasher. What news with you, sir? Here is the cap your worship did bespeak. Why, this was moulded on a porringer, a velvet dish. Fie, fie, tis lewd and filthy. Why, tis a cockle or a walnut shell, a knack, a toy, a trick, a baby's cap. Away with it. Come, let me have a bigger. I'll have no bigger. This doth fit the time, and gentlewomen wear such caps as these. When you are gentle, you shall have one, too, and not till then. Hortensio, aside. That will not be in haste. Why, sir, I trust I may have leave to speak, and speak I will. I am no child, no babe. Your betters have endured me, say my mind, and if you cannot, best you stop your ears. My tongue will tell the anger of my heart, or else my heart, concealing it, will break. And rather than it shall, I will be free even to the utmost as I please in words. Why, thou sayest true, it is a paltry cap, a custard coffin, a bauble, a silken pie. I love thee well, in that thou likest not. Love me or love me not, I like the cap, and it I will have, or I will have none. Exit Haberdasher. Thy gown? Why, eh? Come, tailor, let us see it. Oh, mercy, God, what masking stuff is here? What's this, a sleeve? Tis like a demi-cannon. What, up and down, carved like an apple-tart? Here snip and nip and cut and slish and slash, like to a censer in a barber-shop. Why, what in devil's name, tailor, call'st thou this? Hortensio, aside. I see she's like to have neither cap nor gown. You bid me make it orderly and well, according to the fashion and the time. Marry, and did, but if you be remembered, I did not bid you mar it to the time. Go hop me over every kennel home, for you shall hop without my custom, sir. I'll none of it. Hence, make your best of it. I never saw a better-fashioned gown, more quaint, more pleasing, nor more commendable. Belike you mean to make a puppet of me. Why, true. He means to make a puppet of thee. She says your worship means to make a puppet of her. O oh, monstrous arrogance! Thou liest, thou thread, thou thimble, thou yard, three-quarters, half-yard, quarter-nail, thou flea, thou knit, thou winter cricket, thou, braved in mine own house with a skein of thread. Away, thou rag, thou quantity, thou remnant, or I shall so be meet thee with thy yard, as thou shalt think on prating whilst thou livest. I tell thee, I, that thou hast marred her gown. Your worship is deceived. The gown is made just as my master had direction. Grumio gave order how it should be done. I gave him no order. I gave him the stuff. But how did you desire it should be made? Mary, sir, with needle and thread. But did you not request to have it cut? Thou hast faced many things. I have. Face not me. Thou hast braved many men. Brave not me. I will neither be faced nor braved. I say unto thee, I bid thy master cut out the gown. But I did not bid him cut it to pieces. Ergo, thou liest. Why, here's the note of the fashion to testify. Read it. The note lies in throat, if he say I said so. Imprimis, a loose-bodied gown. Master, if ever I said loose-bodied gown, sew me in the skirts of it, and beat me to death with a bottom of brown thread. I said a gown. Proceed. With a small compassed cape. I confess the cape. With a trunk sleeve. I confess two sleeves. The sleeves curiously cut. Aye, there's the villainy. Error in the bill, sir. Error in the bill. I commanded the sleeves should be cut out, and sewed up again, and that I'll prove upon thee, though thy little finger be armed in a thimble. This is true that I say, and I had thee in place where thou shouldst know it. I am for thee straight. Take thou the bill, give me thy meat yard, and spare not me. God a mercy, Grumio, then he shall have no odds. Well, sir, in brief, the gown is not for me. Y'are the right, sir. Tis for my mistress. 
Go, take it up unto thy master's use. Villain, not for thy life. Take up my mistress's gown for thy master's use. Why, sir, what's your conceit in that? Oh, sir, the conceit is deeper than you think for. Take up my mistress's gown to his master's use. Oh, fie, fie, fie. Petruccio, aside. Hortensio, say thou wilt see the tailor paid. To tailor. Go take it hence, be gone, and say no more. Hortensio, aside to tailor. Tailor, I'll pay thee for thy gown to-morrow. Take no unkindness of his hasty words. Away, I say, commend me to thy master. Exit tailor. Well, come, my Kate, we will unto your fathers, even in these honest, mean habiliments. Our purses shall be proud, our garments poor, for tis the mind that makes the body rich, and as the sun breaks through the darkest clouds, so honour peereth in the meanest habit. What, is the jay more precious than the lark, because his feathers are more beautiful? Or is the adder better than the eel, because his painted skin contents the eye? Oh, no, good Kate, neither art thou the worse for this poor furniture and mean array, if thou accountest it shame. Lay it on me. And therefore, frolic, we will hence forthwith, to feast and sport us at thy father's house. Go call my men, and let us straight to him, and bring our horses unto Long Lane End. There we will mount, and thither walk on foot. Let's see, I think tis now some seven o'clock, and well we may come there by dinner-time. I dare assure you, sir, tis almost two, and twill be supper-time ere you come there. It shall be seven ere I go to horse. Look what I speak, or do, or think to do. You are still crossing it. Sirs, let it alone. I will not go to-day, and ere I do. It shall be what o'clock I say it is. Why, so this gallant will command the sun. Exeunt. Scene four. Padua, before Baptista's house. Enter Tranio and the pedants dressed like Vincenzio. Sir, this is the house. Please it you that I call. Ay, what else? And, but I be deceived, Signor Baptista may remember me, near twenty years ago in Genoa, where we were lodgers at the Pegasus. Tis well, and hold your own in any case, with such austerity as longeth to a father. I warrant you. But, sir, here comes your boy. T'were good he was schooled. Enter Biondello. Fear you not him. Sire Biondello, now do your duty thoroughly, I advise you. Imagined were the right Vincenzio. Tut. Fear not me. But hast thou done thy errand to Baptista? I told him that your father was at Venice, and that you looked for him this day in Padua. Thou art a tall fellow. Hold thee that to drink. Here comes Baptista. Set your countenance, sir. Enter Baptista and Lucentio. Signor Baptista, you are happily met. To the pedant. Sir, this is the gentleman I told you of. I pray you stand good father to me now. Give me Bianca for my patrimony. Soft, son! Sir, by your leave, having come to Padua to gather in some debts, my son Lucentio made me acquainted with a weighty cause of love between your daughter and himself. And, for the good report I hear of you, and for the love he beareth to your daughter and she to him, to stay him not too long, I am content in a good father's care to have him matched. And, if you please to like no worse than I, upon some agreement me shall you find ready and willing, with one consent to have her so bestowed, for curious I cannot be with you, Signor Baptista, of whom I hear so well. Sir, pardon me in what I have to say. Your plainness and your shortness please me well. Right true it is, your son Lucentio here doth love my daughter, and she loveth him, or both dissemble deeply their affections. And therefore, if you say no more than this, that, like a father, you will deal with him, and pass my daughter a sufficient dower, the match is made, and all is done. Your son shall have my daughter with consent. I thank you, sir. Where, then, do you know best we be fied, and such assurance tain as shall with either part's agreement stand? Not in my house, Lucentio, for you know pictures have ears, and I have many servants. Besides, a gremio is hearkening still, and haply we might be interrupted. Uh, then at my lodging, an it like you, there doth my father lie, and there this night will pass the business privately and well. Send for your daughter by your servant here. My boy shall fetch the scrivener presently. 
The worst is this, that at so slender warning you are like to have a thin and slender pittance. It likes me well. Come you, hie you home, and bid Bianca make her ready straight, and, if you will, tell what hath happened. Lucentio's father is arrived in Padua, and how she's like to be Lucentio's wife. I pray the gods she may, with all my heart. Dally not with the gods, but get thee gone. Signor Baptista, shall I lead the way? Welcome, one mess is like to be your cheer. Come, sir, we will better it in Pisa. I follow you. Exeunt Tranio, Pedant, and Baptista. Cambio. What sayest thou, Biondello? You saw my master wink and laugh upon you. Biondello, what of that? Faith, nothing, but has left me here behind to expound the meaning or moral of his signs and tokens. I pray thee, moralize them. Then thus... Baptista is safe, talking with the deceiving father of a deceitful son. And what of him? His daughter is to be brought by you to the supper. And then? The old priest at St. Luke's Church is at your command at all hours. And what of this? I cannot tell, except they are busied about a counterfeit assurance. Take your assurance of her com privilegio ad imprimendum solum to the church, Take the priest, clerk, and some sufficient honest witnesses. If this be not that you look for, I have more to say. But bid Bianca farewell for ever and a day. Here's thou, Biondello. I cannot tarry. I knew a wench married in an afternoon, as she went to the garden for parsley to stuff a rabbit. And so may you, sir, and so adieu, sir. My master hath appointed me to go to St. Luke's to bid the priest be ready to come against you, come with your appendix. Exit. I may and will, if she be so contented. She will be pleased. Then wherefore should I doubt? Hap what hap may, I'll roundly go about her. It shall be hard if Cambio go without her. Exit. Scene five. A public road. Enter Petruccio, Caterina, Hortensio, and servants. Come on, in God's name, once more towards our fathers. Good Lord, how bright and goodly shines the moon. The moon? The sun! It is not moonlight now. I say it is the moon that shines so bright. I know it is the sun that shines so bright. Now by my mother's sun, and that's myself, it shall be moon, or star, or what I list. Or ere I journey to your father's house, go on and fetch our horses back again, ever more crossed and crossed, nothing but crossed. Say as he says, or we shall never go. Forward, I pray, since we have come so far and be it moon or sun or what you please, and if you please to call it a rush-candle, henceforth I vow it shall be so for me. I say it is the moon. I know it is the moon. Nay, then, you lie. It is the blessed sun. Then God be blessed, it is the blessed sun. But sun it is not when you say it is not, and the moon changes even as your mind. What you will have it named, even that it is, and so it shall be so for Catherine. Petruchio, go thy ways, the field is won. Well, forward, forward, thus the bull should run, and not unluckily against the bias, but soft, company is coming here. Enter Vincenzio in a travelling dress. To Vincenzio. Good morrow, gentle mistress, where away? Tell me, sweet Kate, and tell me truly, too, hast thou beheld a fresher gentlewoman? Such war of white and red within her cheeks. What stars do spangle heaven with such beauty as those two eyes become that heavenly face? Fair, lovely maid, once more good day to thee. Sweet Kate, embrace her for her beauty's sake. Ah, we'll make the man mad to make a woman of him. Young budding virgin, fair and fresh and sweet, whither away, or where is thy abode? Happy the parents of so fair a child, Happier the man whom favourable stars allot thee for his lovely bedfellow. Why, how now, Kate? I hope thou art not mad. This is a man, old, wrinkled, faded, withered, and not a maiden, as thou sayest he is. Pardon, old father, my mistaking eyes, that have been so bedazzled with the sun that everything I look on seemeth green. Now I perceive thou art a reverend father. Pardon, I pray thee, for my mad mistaking. Do, good old grandsire, and withal make known which way thou travellest, if along with us. We shall be joyful of thy company. Fair sir, 
and you, my merry mistress, that with your strange encounter much amazed me. My name is called Vincentio, my dwelling Pisa, and bound I am to Padua there to visit a son of mine, which long I have not seen. What is his name? Lucentio, gentle sir. Happily met. The happier for thy son, and now by law, as well as reverend age, I may entitle thee my loving father, the sister to my wife, this gentlewoman, thy son by this hath married. Wonder not, nor be not grieved, she is of good esteem, her dowry wealthy, and of worthy birth. Beside, so qualified as may beseem, the spouse of any noble gentleman, let me embrace with old Vincentio, and wander we to see thy honest son, who will of thy arrival be full and joyous. But is this true? Or is it else your pleasure, like pleasant travellers, to break a jest upon the company you overtake? I do assure thee, father, so it is. Come, go along, and see the truth hereof, for our first merriment hath made thee jealous. Exeunt all but Hortensio. Well, Petruchio, this has put me in heart. Have to my widow, and if she be froward, then thou hast taught Hortensio to be untoward. Exit. End of Act 4. Act 5. Scene 1. Padua, before Lucentio's house. Enter on one side, Biondello, Lucentio, and Bianca. Gremio walking on other side. Softly and swiftly, sir, for the priest is ready. I fly, Biondello. But they may chance to need thee at home. Therefore leave us. Nay, faith. I'll see the church o' your back, and then come back to my masters as soon as I can. Exeunt Lucentio, Bianca, and Biondello. I marvel Cambio comes not all this while. Enter Petruccio, Caterina, Vincenzio, and attendants. Sir, here's the door. This is Lucentio's house. My father's bears more toward the market-place. Thither must I, and here I leave you, sir. You shall not choose but drink before you go. I think I shall command your welcome here, and by all likelihood some cheer is toward. Knox. They are busy within. You were best knock louder. Enter pedant above, at a window. What's he that knocks as he would beat down the gate? Is Signor Lucentio within, sir? He's within, sir, but not to be spoken with all. What if a man bring him a hundred pound or two to make merry with all? Keep your hundred pounds to yourself. He shall need none so long as I live. Nay, I told you your son was well beloved in Padua. Do you hear, sir? To leave frivolous circumstances, I pray you tell Signor Lucentio that his father is come from Pisa, and is here at the door to speak with him. Thou liest! His father is come from Padua, and here, looking out at the window. Art thou his father? Ay, sir, so his mother says, if I may believe her. Why, how now, gentlemen? Why, this is flat knavery to take upon you another man's name. Lay hands on the villain! I believe a means to cousin somebody in this city under my countenance. Re-enter Biondello. I have seen them in the church together. God send them good shipping. But who is here? Mine old master, Vincentio. Now we are undone, and brought to nothing. Vincentio, seeing Biondello. Come hither, crackhimp. I hope I may choose, sir. Come hither, you rogue. What? Have you forgot me? Forgot you? No, sir, I could not forget you, for I never saw you before in all my life. What? You notorious villain? Didst thou never see thy master's father, Vincentio? What, my old worshipful old master? Yes, marry, sir, see where he looks out of the window. Is it so, indeed? He beats Biondello. Help, help, help. Here's a madman will murder me. Exit. Help, son. Help, Signor Baptista. Exit from the window. Prithee, Kate, let's stand aside and see the end of this controversy. They retire. Re-enter pedant below, Baptista, Tranio, and servants. Sir, what are you that offer to beat my servant? What am I, sir? Nay, what are you, sir? Oh, immortal gods! Oh, fine villain! A silken doublet, a velvet hose, a scarlet cloak, and a copatan hat. Oh, I am undone! 
I am undone. While I play the good husband at home, my son and my servant spend all at the university. How now? What's the matter? What? Is the man lunatic? Sir, you seem a sober, ancient gentleman by your habit, but your words show you a madman. Why, sir, what cerns it you if I wear pearl and gold? I thank my good father, I am able to maintain it. Thy father? Oh, villain, he is a sailmaker in Bergamo. You mistake, sir, you mistake, sir. Pray, what do you think is his name? His name? As if I knew not his name. I have brought him up ever since he was three years old, and his name is Tranio. Away, away, mad ass! He is, his name is Lucentio, and he is mine only son and heir to the lands of me, Signor Vincentio. Lucentio? Oh, he hath murdered his master. Lay hold on him, I charge you, in the duke's name. Oh, my son, my son! Tell me, thou villain, where is my son, Lucentio? Call forth an officer. Enter one with an officer. Carry this mad knave to the jail. Father Baptista, I charge you see that he be forthcoming. Carry me to the jail. Stay, officer, he shall not go to prison. Talk not, Signor Grimio, I say he shall go to prison. Take heed, Signor Baptista, lest you be coney catched in this business. I dare swear this is the right Vicentio. Swear if thou darest. Nay, I dare not swear it. Then thou wert best say that I am not Lucentio. Yes, I know thee to be Signor Lucentio. Away with the dotard, to the jail with him. Thus strangers may be hailed and abused, O monstrous villain. Re-enter Biondello with Lucentio and Bianca. Oh, we are spoiled in yonder he is. Deny him, forswear him, or else we are all undone. Lucentio, kneeling. Pardon, sweet father. Lives my sweetest son? Biondello, Tranio, and Pedant run out. Bianca, kneeling. Pardon, dear father. How hast thou offended? Where is Lucentio? Here's Lucentio, right son to the right Vincentio, that have by marriage made thy daughter mine, while counterfeit supposes bleared thine eye. Here's packing with a witness to deceive us all. Where is that damned villain Trenio, that faced and braved me in this matter so? Why, tell me, is not this my cambio? Cambio is changed into Lucentio. Love wrought these miracles. Bianca's love made me exchange my state with Tranio, while he did bear my countenance in the town. And happily I have arrived at the last unto the wished haven of my bliss. What Tranio did, myself enforced him to. Then pardon him, sweet father, for my sake. I have slit the villain's nose that would have sent me to the jail. Baptista, to Lucentio. But do you hear, sir? Have you married my daughter without asking my good will? Fear not, Baptista. We will content you. Go to. But I will in to be revenged for this villainy. Exit. And I to sound the depth of this knavery. Exit. Look not pale, Bianca. Thy father will not frown. Exeunt Lucentio and Bianca. My cake is dough, but I'll in among the rest. Out of hope of all but my share of the feast. Exit. Petruccio and Catarina advance. Husband, let us follow to see the end of this ado. First, kiss me, Kate, and we will. What? In the midst of the street? What? Art thou ashamed of me? No, sir. God forbid. But ashamed to kiss. Why, then let's home again. Come, sirrah, let's away. Nay, I will give thee a kiss. Now pray thee, love, stay. Is not this well? Come, my sweet Kate, better once than never, for never too late. Exeunt. Scene two. A room in Lucentio's house. Enter Baptista, Vincenzio, Gremio, the pedant, Lucentio, Bianca, Petruccio, Caterina, Hortensio, and widow. Tranio, Biondello, and Crumio, and others attending. At last, though long, our jarring notes agree. And time it is when raging war is done to smile at scapes and perils overblown. My fair Bianca, bid my father welcome, while I with self-same kindness welcome thine. 
brother petruchio sister katharina and thou hortensio with thy loving widow feast with the best and welcome to my house my banquet is to close our stomachs up after our great good cheer pray you sit down for now we sit to chat as well as eat they sit at table nothing but sit and sit and eat and eat padua affords this kindness son petruchio Padua affords nothing but what is kind. For both our sakes I would that word were true. Now for my life. Hortensio fears his widow. Then never trust me if I be afeard. You are very sensible, and yet you miss my sense. I mean Hortensio is afeard of you. He that is giddy thinks the world turns round. Roundly replied. Mistress, how mean you that? Thus I conceive by him. Conceives by me? How likes Hortensio that? my widow says thus she conceives her tale very well mended kiss him for that good widow he that is giddy thinks the world turns round i pray you tell me what you meant by that your husband being troubled with a shrew measures my husband's sorrow by his woe and now you know my meaning a very mean meaning right i mean you and i am mean indeed respecting you to her kate to her widow a hundred marks my kate does put her down that's my office spoke like an officer hey to thee lad drinks to hortensio how likes gremio these quick-witted folks believe me sir they butt together well head and butt and a hasty-witted body would say your head and butt were head and horn ay mistress bride hath that awakened you ay but not frighted me therefore i'll sleep again nay that you shall not since you have begun have at you for a bitter jest or two am i your bird i mean to shift my bush and then pursue me as you draw your bow you are welcome all exeunt bianca caterina and widow she hath prevented me here signor tranio this bird you aimed at though you hit her not therefore a health to all that shot and missed oh sir lucentio slipped me like his greyhound which runs himself and catches for his master a good swift simile but something currish tis well sir that you hunted for yourself tis thought your deer does hold you at a bay oh petruchio tranio hits you now i thank thee for that good good tranio confess confess hath he not hit you here i has a little galled me i confess and as the jest did glance away from me tis ten to one it maimed you two outright now in good sadness son petruchio i think thou hast the veriest true of all well i say no and therefore for assurance let's each one send unto his wife and he whose wife is most obedient to come at first when he doth send for her shall win the wager which we will propose content what's the wager twenty crowns twenty crowns i'll venture so much of my hawk or hound but twenty times so much upon my wife a hundred then content a match tis done who shall begin that will i go biondello bid your mistress come to me i go exit son i'll be your half bianca comes i'll have no halves i'll bear it all myself re-enter biondello how now what news sir my mistress sends you word that she is busy and she cannot come how she's busy and she cannot come is that an answer ay and a kind one too pray god sir your wife send you not a worse i hope better sir biondello go and entreat my wife to come to me forthwith exit biondello oh ho entreat her nay then she must needs come i am afraid sir do what you can yours will not be entreated re-enter biondello now where's my wife she says you have some goodly jest in hand she will not come she bids you come to her worse and worse she will not come oh vile intolerable not to be endured sir agromio Go to your mistress. Say, I command her come to me. Exit Grumio. I know her answer. What? She will not. The fowler fortune mine, and there an end. Re-enter Caterina. Now, by my holy dame, here comes Catherina. What is your will, sir, that you send for me? Where is your sister and Hortensio's wife? They sit conferring by the parlour fire. Go fetch them hither. If they deny to come, swing me them soundly forth unto their husbands 
Away, I say, and bring them hither straight. Exit Katerina. Here is a wonder, if you talk of a wonder. And so it is. I wonder what it bodes. Mary, peace it bodes, and love and quiet life, and awful rule, and right supremacy, and, to be short, what not, that's sweet and happy. Now fare before thee, good Petruccio, the wager thou hast won, and I will add unto their losses twenty thousand crowns, another dowry to another daughter, for she is changed, as she had never been. Nay, I will win my wager better yet, and show more sign of her obedience, her new-built virtue and obedience. See where she comes, and brings your froward wives as prisoners to her womanly persuasion. Re-enter Caterina with Bianca and Widow. Catherine, that cap of yours becomes you not. Off with that bauble, throw it under foot. Caterina pulls off her cap and throws it down. Lord, let me never have a cause to sigh, till I be brought to such a silly pass. Fie, what a foolish duty call you this! I would your duty were as foolish too. The wisdom of your duty, fair Bianca, hath cost me a hundred crowns since supper time. <laughs> the more fool you for laying on my duty. Catherine, I charge thee, tell these headstrong women what duty they do owe their lords and husbands. Come, come, you're mocking. We will have no telling. Come on, I say, and first begin with her. She shall not. I say she shall, and first begin with her. Fie, fie! Unknit that threatening, unkind brow, and dart not scornful glances from those eyes to wound thy lord, thy king, thy governor. It blots thy beauty as frosts do bite the meads, confounds thy fame as whirlwinds shake fair buds, and in no sense is meet or amiable. A woman moved is like a fountain troubled, muddy, ill-seeming, thick, bereft of beauty, and while it is so, none so dry or thirsty will deign to sip or touch one drop of it. Thy husband is thy lord, thy life, thy keeper, thy head, thy sovereign, one that cares for thee, and for thy maintenance commits his body to painful labour both by sea and land, to watch the night in storms, the day in cold, whilst thou liest warm at home, secure and safe, and craves no other tribute at thy hands but love, fair looks, and true obedience. Too little payment for so great a debt. Such duty as the subject owes the prince, even such a woman oweth to her husband. And when she is forward, peevish, sullen, sour, and not obedient to his honest will, what is she but a foul contending rebel and graceless traitor to her loving lord? I am ashamed that women are so simple to offer war where they should kneel for peace, or seek for rule, supremacy, and sway, when they are bound to serve, love, and obey. Why are our bodies soft and weak and smooth, unapt to toil and trouble in the world, but that our soft conditions and our hearts should well agree with our external parts? Come, come, you froward and unable worms! My mind hath been as big as one of yours, my heart is great, my reason haply more to bandy word for word and frown for frown. But now I see our lances are but straws, our strength is weak, our weakness past compare, that seeming to be most which we indeed least are. Then veil your stomachs, for it is no boot, and place your hands below your husband's foot, in token of which duty, if he please. My hand is ready. May it do him ease. Why, there's a wench. Come on and kiss me, Kate. Well, go thy ways, old lad, for thou shalt have it. Tis a good hearing when children are toward. But a harsh hearing when women are froward. Come, Kate, and we'll to bed. We three are married, but you two are sped. Twas I won the wager, though you hit the white, and being a winner, God give you good night. Exeunt Petruccio and Caterina. Now go thy ways. Thou hast tamed a cursed shrew. Tis a wonder by your leave. She will be tamed so. Exeunt. 
End of Act 5 End of The Taming of the Shrew by William Shakespeare